Hey there, Golden Bears. How are we today? I hope you're keeping it classy. I know you are, because that's the type of people Golden Bears happen to be. Hey, welcome to Module 1.2, where Portugal and Spain, the European um, mega-sized countries, begin to extend their reach. Before we dive in, as you're going to grow to learn, I love to share little stories about my life to hopefully make some connective tissue to what we're going to be discussing today. Well, my story goes all the way back to 1999. and It was my first trip to the other side of the world. I was on a 21-hour flight that went from LAX, eventually ended into parts of Nepal. I was in this town called Dharan City. It was the third largest town in Nepal and had great opportunity of visiting all sorts of, of, of places there. And, and on one such visit, we were traveling by bus and we were able to get off the bus and cool off underneath the shade of these big trees. And I asked my interpreter if I can go over and, and uh, you know, talk to different people. And while there, underneath this big tree, to avoid just the pummeling heat of Nepal in this August day, um, was a man making this uh, wicker wicker basket chair type thing that kind of curved like this and on the top of it he took old tires from bicycles and then on the top uh, uh so there was a uh, two sections of tires this triangular looking design this way i really wish i had in front of me to show you it was so cool and i saw a bunch of men sitting around this tree sitting on the same type of chair so i asked my interpreter hey would he be able to make me such a chair and and have it ready and uh, the guy gladly says, sure, I certainly would. And um, so we placed the order and says, can you bring it back uh, or be here tomorrow at a certain time with that chair? And the guy goes gladly. And, and uh, so we leave and we go back to the, 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 the bus and I ask my interpreter, well, what do you think that's going to cost? He goes, well, uh, since you're an American, it'll probably be about 50 cents. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness. And I'm like, how can something, you know, be that little. So the next day we go pick it up. I asked the guy, how long did this this um, chair take you to make? He goes, oh, about eight hours. And uh, I go, okay, how much? He goes, well, 50 cents. I just put a lot of effort into this, he, he tells the um, interpreter. The interpreter kind of rolls his eyes and I gladly gave him uh, $2 uh, for the chair as a way of just showing kindness, generosity. You say, how is that possible? An eight hour day for 50 cents? Well, in 1999, in this part of Nepal, the average person made only $250 a year for their income. How is that possible? Well, it goes all the way back to when Europeans felt it would be optimistic, I'm not optimistic, opportune to begin uh, meddling in the affairs of indigenous groups and indigenous regions in order to compete uh, amongst themselves for various resources. And so that is what brought the British in the early 1850s 50, 18, I'm sorry, early 1800s, to find their way into conquering parts of India, or all of India, and parts of Nepal, where it wasn't until uh, 1928 that the Nepalese kind of um, booted out the British, and then eventually, um, by 2008, the king of Nepal uh, seceded to a democratically uh, elected group of people. So I share that with you, knowing that this idea of what we call... Uh, nationalism, but really colonialism um, is a result of, of the Europeans of, of kind of expanding their reach, if you will, uh, into the world around them simply by looking for resources to glean. So with that, that launches us into Hernan Cortes. He was a, a, uh, a early explorer uh, sent over by uh, King Ferdinand and Isabel, the Queen Isabel, and, and to kind of find out who were these people groups where they hear untold gold and riches had come from. It's called the, the Atlan. And where do these legends come from? Well, they came all the way over from Florida where Columbus and, and uh, had landed in San Salvador. I'll talk about that later. But it, it was just these legacies going on. And so uh, the queen sent over uh, because of these legacies uh, passed on by Columbus. Hernan Cortes goes over with a fully supported uh, ship. Why did he go over? We Spaniards know a sickness of the heart that only gold can cure. When Hernan Cortes landed, and we'll talk about him in subsequent um, lectures, he literally did the following thing. He burnt the boats to 
the ocean. We're talking an armada, uh, eight to 10 boats filled with all of his soldiers. He took them to the land uh, and for two years time, they marched around and tried to do some things with the Aztec people, which I'll talk about here in subsequent lectures. But ultimately he burned the boats so nobody can return home. He found his paradise. He found his place where he can govern and dictate the terms of, in fact, you know, he controlled an entire Aztecian empire. And why would he want to go back? He's his own king here. So that's a very interesting story um, behind uh, how many of the soldiers who came over to seek their fortune and were hoping to go back to, to Europe and back to Spain specifically, were not able to. And this is when, what creates an entire people group called the Mestizo that we'll talk about in another time period as well. What are some things that are targets that we're gonna ex expand upon? Because of Europe um, needing economic or growing economically and militaries competing uh, against one another, namely, you know, um, the Dutch, the, the, the Portuguese, um, you, you will see the emerging British later on um, competing for this. Um, but this, this causes expansion into new places. You see new technology emerging and you begin seeing how these transoceanic methods enable trade to happen quicker and, and more uh, with guaranteed of success than ever, ever before. So that takes us to this map. So I had to geek out on this map for a little bit, but I think it's important to do. So here we have over here, this thing called the Silk Road, okay, coming across from the Asian ports. And what, what was uh, the reason uh, for this? Well, Marco Polo had gone over and he thought he found China, but really he probably found parts of India. And it was there his stories in the 1200s regaled Europeans with, silks and golds and perfumes and medicines to, to help the aching body, all sorts of things. And so with that, trade routes began to emerge across um, the, the, the east. And these trade routes brought all the things that the Europeans had wanted, everything from the sugars to the silks. Well, in between all of this, you have Muslims who are dominating this region here, all of this region here ever since 600, um, and, and had dominated, they were the major religious people group that, that filled these things as well. Well, the Christians of, of Northern Europe and including Spain and Portugal uh, didn't necessarily like uh, dealing with them. And I can't get into too much detail about uh, the religious wars that were taking place, but they had to look for a different um, means about this. Portugal had already begun kind of tra traveling southward along here to find find new routes. How could they do that? Well, they had developed this boat here that I'll talk about here in a moment, this boat that can sail southward. And you say, well, what's the big deal about sailing southward? Well, the problem with sailing southward is the wind from the north always blows southward. The current always blows southward. So if you ever wanted to do trade, you would have to go down, but how would you ever get back? Well, the only way to get back was, yeah, go through the jungles and then cross the Sahara. No, that's not gonna be the case. So once new sailing techniques were developed that I'll talk about here momentarily, I just wanted to show you this map so it kind of would make sense to you. This is what began opening up entirely new aspects of Africa. What does that lead to? More gold but also the slave trade will begin to expand and that's gonna become another issue in time period two and in time period three, okay? But most of this area, we see Europe only is doing trading up here um, in the northern parts of Africa, along the parts of the Mediterranean and in this region. The second point that we wanna recognize is that we see Spain beginning to solidify and, and it was broken up into three basic um, regions and here you have uh, the Aragon family, um, Ferdinand and Isabel from, I forget where her region was from, but essentially they formed a union through marriage and because of that brought peace between three different unique um, countries, if you will, and brought them under one nationalistic crown of a king and queen who now recognize that if we're ever going to compete against Portugal and, and their capital of Lisbon here, we have to begin recognizing maybe there's some new worlds of which we can maybe find an opening elsewhere to circumnavigate 
all of these pathways that the Portuguese already had dominated. They had already dominated this coastal area here, and they were already making ends to try and get all the way around the tip of Africa and into India. Uh, they thought, the, the Spanish thought, well, what if we looked elsewhere to create these types of pathways. So sorry to geek out for those few minutes there, but I think it's important for you to kind of see kind of the significance of this. During this time, we see power structures emerging in Europe. Why is there power structures emerging? Under feudalism. Feudalism, if, if you don't know, is, is a system that's both political and economic to make sure that the poor of poor, known as serfs, stay tied to the land and enable those who are either the church or the clergy or who are in the um, nobility, noble classes, that they kind of get to dictate the terms of things. Uh, well, during this time, however, um, with the growing Renaissance and the opening of the printing press and, and new inventions, we began seeing challenges against this type of structure in Europe, okay? And, and this pushed for um, the European rulers to find ways to how do they begin unifying under uh, a certain flag or under particular rulers with that. In order to fund their political plans and ambitions, they had to find new trade routes and find ways to eliminate the middlemen. Who were the middlemen? The Arabs or the Muslims who were making all the money bringing things across the silk trade route um, or, this, or the Portuguese who were sailing south along the eastern coast of Africa. They needed to find new avenues and new opportunities. At the same time, we begin seeing the missionaries bringing back new, these missionaries that had gone to India, these missionaries that had gone to China, these missionaries that had gone to um, other Southeast Asian regions. They're talking about these new things of astronomy and shipbuilding and map making and, and, and such. And so this helped fuel these kings and queens to begin saying, hmm, maybe if we're going to ever grow and expand our power and influence, we too should be looking outward. And so here you see these Renaissance uh, trade routes that would eventually start all the way here in Guangzhou um, and Hangzhou of China, finding the way, getting different um, things to trade and eventually going through Constantinople, which at this point, most of this is the Arab world controlling these types of things. And so the Europeans then would show up here in Constantinople and have to pay premium, premium dollars in order to get the goods from here back to Europe where they had hoped there would still be enough of a profit margin based on what the Europeans can afford to, to do, basically the nobles during that time. So it's a very interesting business proposition is do what? What if we eliminate this Constantinople and all the Muslim Islamic silk trade route and just somehow find an oceanic route that gets us all the way over here to China or parts of India in order to get those said commodities. So in class, we will discuss these things. So hopefully you can see those questions and be prepared to, to examine those. Again, here are some worksheets that um, you can use to guide your reading as you talk about how the, the, the Spaniards uh, or, or the Portuguese had brought about a major change to this. So with that, let's talk about the Portuguese and, and how uh, what they did uh, in order to kind of become the leading uh, gurus of the ship industry, if you will. First of all, uh, Prince Henry of Portugal, he was like the Elon Musk of the time. He put together the baddest, the fastest, the strongest, uh, the quickest uh, group of scientists and, and others to kind of develop uh, what has Elon Musk done, you know, everything from the tunneling system to, um, you know, launching SpaceX to, of course, the Tesla car, uh, and te incredible, brilliant person that has brought together tons of people. Well, what did Henry uh, of Portugal do? He brought together his all-star team of, of astronomers and geographers and map makers, etc. He, he recruited cartographers or map makers and, and navigators that knew how to use the astrolabe that I'll talk about here more importantly, and, and sailors and captains that knew how to manage ships. So he was, you know, a very instrumental person that was not only willing to put this all-star team together, but bankroll them. And that's going to make them really, really unique, um, is, is that someone has to pay for these types of things. And, and that is what is going to enable Portugal to become a very strong, unified state. And soon Spain will follow that same kind of play that, that uh, Henry the Navigator, as he's called there, 
would take. So here's a map of that time period that shows you really kind of an understanding that is really infantile. I'll talk more about this in class, but recognize they have a pretty good understanding of, of, of Africa. I mean, they even got Madagascar here. Um, Europe is still a little out of, uh, ironically, is out of um, proportion for sure. They do have India. Um, here they have the Arabian Peninsula. It kind of looks like that. Um, they know that there is a Strait of Malacca here, which allows you to travel here uh, between in, 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 you know this, this region here, what we call modern day Singapore. But look how big they have Australia uh, down here. And look how small they have China going into Russia. So, and then, you know, the new world. They do have a decent idea of, Af uh, of, of South America. They have the makeup of the islands here of the Bahamas and into uh, Ucatan Peninsula, Mexico. So not too far off. How did they get this? Is it word of mouth? Is it other people who've, who've drawn up these types of things? But using these maps, they had a pretty good idea of that where they were going and then for sure that there was not a place where they were going to fall off the end of the world like Columbus thought he was going to do um, after that. So another aspect of how they pursue this long distance trade, it's called the Caravel. And the Caravel is a unique boat design that allowed them not just to go south on the map like I showed you earlier, but it enabled them to go back up against the current by doing this zigzagging thing. And what they really discovered is they can go all the way out to the Azores. That's why still to this day, Spain, or I mean Portugal, uh, is in control of the Azores. But they would go all the way from Africa, tack, boom, 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 all this way in one side of the wind. So it's kind of cool that they can use these sails to capture a northern blowing um, wind, but still sail north into it, and then tack back, and then they found themselves hitting right into Lisbon. Pretty cool. Uh, design and that these are the boats that were used by the Portuguese and eventually the Spanish and then eventually the British and the Dutch, etc. They were able to take these longer voyages that were not even dreamed possible. Then we have the Astrolabe, which is interestingly designed by the Greeks, but it was actually used by the, the Muslim population initially in 600 because if you are familiar with the, the, the five pillars of faith of the Islamic um, belief system that you got to pray to Mecca uh, five times a day. And if you're out traveling on the Saharan desert, or if you're out traveling by boat somewhere, or if you're on the Silk Road, how do you know where Mecca is? Well, you use this astrolabe to look up at the stars and then use this with the horizon line. And pretty much that will give you an idea as to where Mecca was. Well, the sailor said, well, if we can use that to navigate land, why couldn't we use that to navigate along the oceans? And this is what enabled them to kind of oh, open up the new ideas that maybe we can really get places uh, and follow a roadmap, if you will, guided by the stars to duplicate finding these ports of call as we go. And as I mentioned to you earlier, it's because of these astrolabes and because of the caravel, it was the Portuguese. You need to hear this from me. Portuguese, Portuguese, Portuguese. They were the first European people group that on a massive scale began enslaving people from West Africa. They began discovering as they went south along the coast of Eastern Africa, um, of, I'm sorry, Western Africa, that they, they would find uh, people who've gone before them on a smaller scale who were Arab traders and that would trade with chiefs of um, different African tribes. And they, would, they, they duplicated what the Arabs and the chiefs had done, but they said on a grander scale. And so it was the Portuguese that not only began getting gold and ivory from Africa, but also these enslaved people groups that they would then take to different parts. Who would be the different parts? Essentially all of Brazil, or as we know, South America, and then the Bahama regions will be, slaves will be brought over for the sugar industry that we'll talk much about later on in a different time period. But you need to recognize there's reasons for these slaves to come. So it's not the British that brought them over first. It wasn't the Spanish that brought them over first. Okay, it wasn't the Dutch. In fact, for the most part, the Dutch were pretty good to it. Um, it was the Portuguese that had brought them over to the New World at that time. Well, Spain now is frustrated. <laughs> they want to get into the mix. And so, as I alluded to earlier, um, they they begin, Isabel and uh, Fernandez, they begin forming a nation state called Spain. 
They recognize that the Islamic uh, religion, they cloak it as religion, um, is impeding their ability to actually make a profit. And so uh, in begins the Inquisition, um, not only of, uh, of Christians in their home country, but also this anti-Islamic uh, slam. And so um, it is here that we'll begin um, seeing some interesting things taking place in Spain that is recognizing uh, that they want to begin looking outward. And so they look for trade uh, with Africa, India, and these Asiatic lands. But um, they, they had it mostly for, um, they, they cloaked it as a religious uh, aspect, vastly different than what the Portuguese. Portuguese, it was purely economic. There was nothing about religion at all, but it was the Spanish that came in with this mindset that, well, let's bring Christianity along with this uh, to help validate as to why we're going to create new trade amongst these people. So here you have Galileo in the 1600s who <laughs> um, was arguing that, no, the world in fact was not, uh, you know, that, that, was, that it was not the center of the universe but it could be possibly the sun is the center of the universe. And this went against what they believed or perceived to be the biblical uh, truth to the matter. And this is of course why the church stepped in and, and this Galileo trial took place in 1633 of uh, this heliocentric astronomical model uh, that was at its place to where we see ourselves in the solar system. And, and this came about as a result of the early part of the Renaissance, but it was these challenges that was taking place in, in Portugal and Spain that was creating some kind of different um, kind of confusing times. Well, as we move forward, we have the third point here is that Portugal and Spain now are in competition. And as their populations are increasing and the nobility class is increasing, uh, the agricultural productivity is going up uh, and the government is becoming more politically uh, stable and capable of managing themselves, we begin seeing both Portugal and Spain doing something rather unique. And we, will, we won't see this take place when we're talking about the British colonies sending over initially. You know, that was for religious reasons, but here you need to be mindful that it was Portugal that was for financial, Spain it was financial and religious. And, and there's a great book uh, written in the, um, 1995 or 96, I wish I had written down the author, but basically said the world is flattening. And in today's economy, when we say the world is flat, we're talking essentially about how um, that due to globalization, countries like in Southeast Asia and their factories are able to produce things just as fast and as good as quality as they would here in the States. And so with, with this um, flattening, if you will, we no longer need to have things stored up for two years in a warehouse before it can be shipped here. You can streamline things through computer and technology and, and shipping, etc., where you can order it in Southeast Asia and have it here in America typically in three weeks. Well, this all worked good until 2020 and 2021, of course, with the whole um, pandemic and things shut down. But for the most part, um, that is how the global economy works. Well, what was causing the world to flatten then is that you see Portugal and Spain recognizing that we can pursue money or actually resources outside of our country and bring that back. And we can do that by using labor from Africa, resources from the new world, and have our technology, our money, and our people uh, to go and do this. So it became this little triangular thing that I'll talk more about in Greater Geeky information later on. So I've talked about this earlier in my lecture. So they decide, uh, the Spain decides to cross the Atlantic. They want to go one up over Portugal. And, and with that, Christopher Columbus comes and presents his ideas to Ferdinand and Isabella. And they're like, sure, we'll throw a little bit of coin your way. Bling, bling, bling. Go put together some boats here for you. And, and see if you can make it across. So put together a ragged muffin group of people and bump. Six weeks later, I think it was, um, a group that was about to be in mutiny. They see land there, this island of San Salvador. They mistakenly, uh, you know, kind of, uh, they thought they landed in the New World. And, and it's kind of funny that here in 1492, he thought he was in the Indies. 
um, this is like the greatest historical failure of all time. And, uh, and what was the failure is that Columbus then went on to tell others that for sure there is a river system or an ocean system that will allow you to um, bust through here and get to uh, uh, in, uh, India and you know on to China rather quickly. Well, that was the big blunder. No, what he discovered was in a completely different new continent, as you know. And uh, there was going to be no route that would go through until the Panama Canal uh, was opened uh, during that time. So here you can see um, the, the Spanish incursions and their influence um, of, of bringing um, not only boats of, of people that are coming from their Spanish soil and their ideas of religion and their ideas that we'll talk about the encomienda system, etc. But they're also going to begin um, showing new routes to the Portuguese. And the Portuguese are going to begin also bringing slaves to be doing the mining and farming that you'll see along here. Sugar will eventually show up in this point here, okay, and and making their way into Veracruz and, and, and into that area there as well. So Spain has been taking a, a big uh, step, courtesy of Columbus, to radically alter the landscape of a people group that were doing incredibly well all on their own, incredibly sophisticated, incredibly uh, gifted in so many ways. And what happens? Uh, they come in and they basically ruin the paradise simply because of the desire for resources to help fuel their appetite for nationalistic or political reasons in, in Spain and Portugal. And eventually it'll be captured by the other nation states that are there. So in conclusion, because of the technological innovations and a desire to find trade that would be more advantageous to the Europeans and not have to go through the Muslim nations, so to speak, okay, and reduce economic competitions, they began looking for voyages that would take them to quicker to the, the Chinese or Indian uh, regions. Portugal secures posts along Africa, which then led to, of course, gaining gold and and ivory, but slaves, that will be important later on. Spain then gets to the Americas and begins opening the doors for new Americas, uh, Europeans to arrive there. So this is where we begin to see things fall apart, as we call it, uh, courtesy of the arrival of the European. So it is with that, um, we will look over these other items when we come into class. So keep it classy, golden bears. You're awesome, and take care.